Good morning. Welcome to Providence United Methodist Church. I'm so grateful that you have decided to plug in to us this morning. We pray a blessing upon you and for all who are listening. I do have a bit of news on Leslie Lee Bradshaw Jr. passed away on yesterday um, from Cedarfield Nursing Home from the coronavirus. So let us offer a moment of silence to give God praise and thanks for his life. Amen. Our call to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Praise the God of this day, whose steadfast love endures forever. Praise the God of salvation, who does marvelous things. Praise the God of everlasting life. Amen. Our first hymn will be on page 307, Christ is Risen. Good morning, kids. I wanted to bring a children's message to you this morning. Let me just say that I miss all of you. And uh, so this is a great time. I hope you enjoy it. There's a very interesting book called Believe It or Not by Robert Ripley. And Mr. Ripley enjoyed collecting strange and amazing bits of information, which although they seemed unbelievable, some say they were quite true. But let me give you some of the examples. A man by the name of James Cook once had a chicken that laid a perfectly square egg. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen brown eggs and spotted eggs and white eggs, and, but I've never seen a square egg. 
Have you? I think I would have to see it in order to believe it. Joanne Bonds was a 15-year-old from California, and she once swung a lot of hula hoops around her body. How many of you think that she did at one time? She did 68 hula hoops around her body at one time. I can't even do one. I don't know. I just don't have the motion or whatever it is. But she did 68. Would you need to see it in order to believe it? One more. How long do you think was the world's largest hot dog? I'll let you take a guess. The world's largest hot dog was over 3,000 feet long, and it took 103 people to carry it. It weighed 885 pounds. Would you need to see it in order to believe it? This book was filled with many things that are hard to believe. The lesson for you comes from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. And in this particular text, Jesus has appeared to the other disciples, and Thomas was not there, so they told Thomas that they had seen Jesus alive. And Thomas says, I won't believe it until I see it with my own eyes. I want to put my finger and his nail prints in his hands. And I want to place my hand where they passed him in the side. A week later, Thomas saw Jesus for himself. And Jesus invited Thomas to touch his hands where the nail marks were, and he told him to put his hand in the side. Then Thomas believed. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. A lot of people today won't believe that Jesus really rose from the dead because they didn't see it for themselves. But do you know what? It's true, whether they believe it or not. You and I have never seen Jesus, but we believe him. And we accept him by faith, even though we have not seen him. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you that you help us to accept things by faith. And one is that you have risen from the grave and that you are alive forevermore. We give you thanks and praise on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Now, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn receive, in which you also stand, through which also you are being saved if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I hand it unto you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve, 
And when he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of who are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. May the Lord add a rich blessing to the reading, the hearing of God's holy word. May it sink deep down and bring forth much fruit, the word of God for the people of God. The next song we're going to sing is called Resurrecting, and it's a beautiful uh, hymn-like song that talks about the resurrection, of course, uh, why it's called Resurrecting. But one of the things that I really love about this song is that it ends with the refrain, the resurrected king is resurrecting me. And I just want you to pause and think about what that looks like for you in your own life. Knowing that Jesus was resurrected, and we understand that for him, he was resurrected. But what does it mean to have the power of the resurrection residing in us as children of God? And just think about the resurrected king is resurrecting you each and every day.
I'm so delighted that Linda Kirchie has come back for another week to play the handbells for us. So this morning we're going to be sharing In the Garden, uh, which I know is a favorite for many of you, and I hope that you enjoyed this duet.
there was an illiterate dad and his son who had a PhD in astrology decided to go camping. They unpacked and they set up their tent after dinner. They went to sleep. A few hours later, the dad woke up. Looking up at the stars, he woke up his son and he said, son, what do you see? His son said, astronomically speaking, it tells me that there are many galaxies out there. Theologically speaking, it was on the fourth day that God made the sun, the moon, and the stars good law. Some have alleged that the sun and the moon and the stars were created in the beginning in Genesis 1-1, and his father stopped him. And he said, no, fool. You're able to see the stars because somebody's stolen our tent. Sometimes we're too smart for our own good, amen? Once Billy Graham was challenged when giving a message on the reality of God and his son Jesus Christ. And someone said to him, Hi, Mr. Graham, you talk much about God as if he lives. God is dead. He has no power in the affairs of men. Billy Graham, in Billy Graham's fashion, calmly replied, I do not know of his death. I spoke to him this morning. Those who know it all are sometimes annoying to those who actually know. What am I saying? My grandparents believed in the resurrection. Their grandparents believed in the resurrection. And their grandparents believed in the resurrection, and so forth and so on. It's the tenet of our faith. They believed in the promises of God in John chapter 14, where Jesus says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Believe also in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, ye may be also. They held on to this, that because Jesus rose from the dead and Jesus ascended and sits at the right hand of God the Father, that when our day come, we too will rise from the dead. The Apostle Paul is telling us to think soberly about these things. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that education must enable one to sift and to weigh evidence, to discern the truth from the false, the real from the unreal, and the facts from fiction. Function of education, therefore, is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. Let us think intensively and critically about the truth that the Apostle Paul is sharing with us on this great day. I want to challenge your thinking with a thought the other side of the Easter tide. The other side of the Easter tide. Some 17 years after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, a Jew by the name of Saul, whose name was changed to Paul on his spiritual journey. Some of you may remember the encounter that the apostle Paul had with Jesus on the road to Damascus, and it was there that Paul 
had given his life to Christ and was sold out. But here, he has written a letter of encouragement to the church of Corinth, the church that he himself started. This church was made up of non-Jews, Gentiles, rich and poor. In Paul's day, Corinth was a commercial hub, a religious center. It was a huge city of diversity because sailors and traders came to trade. In so doing, they brought their own respective religions. Therefore, there was also religious diversity. Unfortunately, Corinth became known as Sin City. And as a result, they earned the reputation of the rich treating, the, treating poor people inadequately and off color. And sadly, this even happened in the church. In other words, they made the poor beg for the basic needs, and even when it came to serving church or serving communion, the poor were served last in the church. Surely Paul needed to address this issue because it began to breed disunity and it created pockets of division. Paul has been calling the Corinth church to action. He said that they should promote unity and not disunity. That they should battle sin together, that they should pursue relationships with one another, reflecting Christ's love. That they should worship appropriately and do away with idol worship. That the gifts of the Spirit given to the church should not be neglected or abused. These are the practical things that the Apostle Paul was submitting. And then he moves again to right thinking about Jesus. And he does so with a pastoral heart. Paul reminds the church of what formed them and what gives them security, hope, and even greater faith. He's suggesting that that security, that that hope and greater faith should become center stage in our lives. This is the gospel. This is the good news that Paul has been preaching. But let's go a little deeper. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 and 2 says, Now I declare to you, brothers and sisters, the good news which I preach to you, which also you receive and which also you stand by, which also you are saved. And if you hold firmly to the word that I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Paul spent 18 months in Corinth setting up this church. He was the first who made these folks aware of Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension. And basically, Paul is saying, I don't know what you are believing, but if you believe what I've preached to you, then you're going to be okay. Because I'm preaching to you what God has given to me. But if you're believing something else, then I believe what you're believing is in vain. So a great deal depends on what the Corinth community had begun to believe. Most of us understand that what is said and what is heard are not necessarily the same thing. There remains a distinct possibility that these Corinth Christians 
had believed something quite different from the gospel that Paul proclaimed to them. Verse 3, Christ died for our sins. The first thing I did was place before you what was placed so emphatically before me that the Messiah died for our sins. And Paul says that's exactly what the scripture says. He reminds the Corinth community of the gospel that he had preached to them. And he says the message is pretty simple. Jesus died for all of our sins. It was simple to some and complex to others, but Paul is saying whether it's simple or complex, that does not matter. What matters most is that Jesus died for all of our sins, whether you believe it or not. In Paul's day, everyone had someone over them. For example, the Roman government. And Paul is saying to all of the believers that there's still someone over you. And it's Jesus Christ. Our allegiance should be to Christ alone. In other words, based on what Christ had done for us on Good Friday, we all have been set free from bondage and the slavery of sin. Paul is alluding to the fact that we are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper on this journey called faith. No longer strangers, but members of God's family. And maybe you missed it, but Paul is saying we should act like it. Amen? Your hope should never be in people places, or things. Our hope should never be in wealth or material things where moth and rust and thieves will have their way. Paul says our hope is in the Lord. Verses 5 through 7, Paul says Jesus shows up. Listen. And that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. United Methodist women, I hope you're listening right now, because according to the Apostle Paul, he says that Jesus first showed himself to women. Somebody ought to say amen. And then he showed himself to Cephas, which is Peter. And then he shows himself to two travelers on the road to Emmaus. And finally, he shows himself to his disciples. And scripture says that over the course, he showed himself to over 500 witnesses after the resurrection. Jesus knew that his disciples and that the world needed him to show up. My question for you this morning is, has Jesus shown up for you in your life? Has he shown up just when you needed him? When you didn't think that there was a way, did he show up for you? Has Jesus spoken peace to you? Has Jesus been your bridge over troubled water? Has he been your provider? Has he been your savior, your friend? your doctor, your lawyer? When and where has Jesus shown up for you? My point is this. Jesus shows up just when we need him, when we least expect it. He shows up 
And he encourages us in the faith. He shows up to give us comfort in times of grief, joy in the midst of our suffering. Jesus shows up and he shows us love in the midst of hate. It is with these assurances that we find hope in the midst of our pain. He may not show up when you want him, but he's always on time and he's faithful to show up. Lo, I will be with you always, even unto the ends of the age. Verses 8 through 10. Christ can work through any opposition. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of all the apostles, unfit to be a called an apostle. For I'm the least of the apostles, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. I like this part because the Apostle Paul is being transparent. He's not trying to be something that he's not. And he confesses his former life of being a chief persecutor of the church. And I hear his regret. But that's how Paul came to understand that God can work through any opposition. If he can use someone like me, Paul is saying, then surely he can use you. If he can use someone like me who persecuted his church, then surely he can use someone like you. Jesus knew how to work through opposition. He was opposed by the Sadducees. He was opposed by the Pharisees. He was opposed by King Herod, the scribes and people of the, of the land. Yet they all failed in their attempts to block him, to stop him, or to oppose what God had planned. Your implicit question is, why did they fail? I'm so glad you asked. Isaiah 54, verse 17 says it like this. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall pass. So shall prosper, and you shall confute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication from me, says the Lord. The resurrection proves that God is unstoppable. Somebody say unstoppable. God is always moving. His kingdom is always advancing. Nothing in heaven or earth can stop the forward movement and the progression of God. The church ought to say amen. We can't stop what God is doing. No matter what a man or a woman or government does, no one can stop God. You see, because thy will will be done on earth even as it's done in heaven. God always trumps mankind's petty kingdoms and idols of worship. His purposes move on to their ultimate end. God is wise and brilliant in his moves to perform his will and to conquer all of his enemies. God is unstoppable.
No government, no law, no devil's spirit, no earthly power, no philosophy, no person on earth can stop God's will and God's purposes from being accomplished. God is unstoppable. God is the great I am in his power, glory, and greatness is beyond, beyond human comprehension. Tozer once said it like this, God being who he is cannot cease to be what he is. And being what he is, he cannot act out of character with himself. He is faithful and immutable. So all of his words and his acts must be faithful. God is unstoppable. That's Paul's message. That's the message that we need this morning. Some of you are facing many things besides the coronavirus. Some of you are looking at situations that seem bleak. But I want you to remember that you serve an unstoppable God. and He won't stop to work on your behalf. Working things for your good. All things work together for good to them that love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. God is unstoppable. We need to trust him. In the midst of uncertainty, we need to trust him. This is the message that Paul has given to the Corinth community, and it comes across the vista of time to you and I. This is the message that we need to hear, that God is unstoppable. Let us pray. Most gracious God, you are an awesome God. and We thank you for loving us the way that you do. That you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. 17 years after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, The Apostle Paul comes along, believing that he was right to persecute the church. But Father, we're so grateful today that he had an encounter with you. Because we know that no one who has an encounter with you could ever remain the same. Paul was sold out. Help us to live as people who are sold out for Christ. Thank you for the saints who walk with faith and teaching us how to continue to be encouraged. I think of Ralph Vernon facing cancer and yet he knows that you are an unstoppable God. I think of Jim DeLapp dealing with cancer again and again and again. But he knows that you are an unstoppable God. I think of people on the other side of grief, a Joe Lee King, a Susan Nash, or Linda Carey, and so many of us. Their witness have encouraged us in the faith. I think of a Marion Crowder, 
who in her own estimation doesn't believe that she has a lot to give, but she is faithful, hallelujah, to show up every week and just to offer herself in the service of the Lord. Father, I think of those who show up today to offer their gifts in music so that others who are listening to this live stream will be touched. Maybe they didn't hear the children's message. Maybe they didn't hear your message, but maybe they heard it through the music. Lord, all I, all I know is when you show up, great things can happen. And we pray that you've shown up for the listeners. That we pray that you have shown up for those who are watching. And Lord, we don't know what they stand in need of, but you do. You're omnipresent. Be with them right now, Lord. Bless them right where they are. Lift them up to their highest possibility in you. Have your way. Let your will be done. And in Jesus' name we praise you. And all of God's people said. Last hymn is hymn 364, Because He Lives. And I pray as you sing it, you will listen to the words and experience the joy because he lives.
so grateful that you have decided to plug into our live stream. We pray today that the service has been a blessing for you. Um, we are taking prayers. You can find us on our web, providenceumc.net, and we would love to take your prayers for our congregation. Um, we're coming into the office once a week. Still, um, the church needs to function, so continue to do what you're doing in terms of sending in your tithes and your offerings. I pray today has truly been a blessing for you. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift your countenance and grant us all God's great peace. Please be at peace. Amen.